Um, this is the rabbi of rabbis, the teacher of teachers, the dean of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies, colleague to Rabbi Cheryl Peretz, um, really, truly um, one of the great wise teachers of our time um, and a very dear friend um, who we are very proud to have as a beloved member of our own community. I'm so excited that we get the chance to learn now with Rabbi Brad Artson. Thank you. Um, so I want to try to catch up in our time because I know uh, there's a lot going on tonight and I want to go to some of those other programs too. Um, Here's a couple things I want to share. The first is, Sharon, I believe that tonight is an anniversary. It is. So happy anniversary. Oh. That is amazing. Between God and Israel and David. It's like a wedding ceremony with God and Israel. But, but this, the two of you are one of those rare couples where each of you married up. And I just want to say from personal experience that the first 26 years are the hardest. So smooth sailing from here on in. Uh, right, dear? OK, good. Yeah. Um, second thing I want to tell you is that one of the benefits of my second round of cancer surgery is that I can now fit in my favorite t-shirt again. Um, this t-shirt has chemistry and Hebrew, two of my favorite things. So um, enjoy it. <laughs> you have the pretty colored picture and some text in front of you. I want to say one thing in descent from that brilliant, brilliant, amazing panel. Part of what taking process seriously means is to be suspicious of rigid dichotomies. And one of the rigid dichotomies we often pay lip service to is the distinction between brain and emotion. And I want to tell you that is part of supremacy, it is part of patriarchy, and it is utterly false. Right? Mind is a thing that brains do. But mind is bigger than just neurology. And neurology itself does not stay in the cranium. You talk about a gut feeling, that's because much of your nervous system extends all the way down, right? And in fact, extends beyond your body out into the world. The Hebrew Bible understands that, and it understands that lev is the seat both of cognition and of emotion. Both. If you don't have your feeling engines running, you won't engage in crisp thinking. And if you don't engage in sharp thinking, your feeling remains muddy and inchoate. So what you saw on the panel was a remarkable blend of deep, deep reflection and powerful intuition, but then in the West, we fall back on dichotomizing those. And I just want to strike a blow against that. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I have been thinking a lot about creativity and Torah. That's partly because I'm also revving up to write my next book, part of my how I make myself happy. I'm happy when I have a project. Um, and I also don't know what I think until I write it down. So I've been thinking about the bridge between the last book I wrote, which was about creation and science, and revelation. And so the first thing I want to say is in Jewish tradition and experience, there's this weird double loop that goes on. We know about creation because it's written in a book. That is to say, the revealed Torah starts by talking about creation and therefore portrays God as an artist. God is the one who was the very first to know by doing, to know by making. 
God had no idea how the universe was going to turn out, according to the story in the books of Genesis. Right? God is surprised all the time, not least surprised by the way people turn out. Oh, my me, said God. You are evil from the time of your birth, as if God didn't know that that was coming. So we know creation through revelation. But of course, revelation had to have a universe to happen in. So revelation is part of the unfolding of creation. A creation that reveals, a revelation that creates, they're looped together. Another dichotomy bites the dust. So that's something that I was drawn to because in process thinking, which is a school of philosophical thought that says that the universe is not made up of solid substances that bang into each other on the outside. That's an old Newtonian and Greek way of viewing the universe that we have now scientifically moved beyond. The universe is made of shimmering interactive patterns of energy and those interactive patterns of energy respond to what's going on around them, react in a way that becomes data for every other piece of shimmering energy. So the universe is a constant flow of taking in the information of the rest of the world, internalizing it, making a choice what you're going to do with that, and then putting that choice out into the universe for the universe to respond to. That means that the universe is always becoming. And it is always relating. There is no being. Being is a logical abstraction. There is only becoming. And becoming never happens in isolation. Becoming is always in interactivity, in relationship with every other becoming. We are all becomings shaping the other becomings. And the only difference between us and God, there are actually several, but one of the big ones here is that we each know the interactions and becomings that relate to us, that are within our observable sphere. God alone integrates all becoming across all time. And because God knows absolutely everything there is to know, God forever retains every choice ever made. And God knows the past and the present. But the future isn't decided yet. The future is not a thing to know or not know. So God is eagerly anticipating. Thank you for catching that. Best movie ever. God is eagerly anticipating our choices to see which universe potential will become actual. You with me so far? The universe is a collection of interlocking becomings. The future is multiple and open. And we all make our choices, which helps determine what the future is going to be. And once we've done that, once that becomes present, then God knows it forever. OK, now part of what that means then is that both creation and revelation are not specific events. They're not punctuated moments. They are processes that are happening all the time. I love the fact that our prayer book speaks about God as notain Torah, the one who gives Torah. It's said in the present. Because Torah, which is the Hebrew word for teaching, is happening at every instant. At every instant that we're open to it. You know, you can't give a Torah that won't be received. 
So the giving of the Torah, the priming of the pump, is our being willing to accept it. But accepting Torah is not passive. We and God decided what Torah would become the Torah we have. We and God interpret the Torah and decide how it gets applied. Right? This is not God is active and we are passive. Right? Every creating event, you, me, the trees, the rocks, the planets, the system as a whole, everything is a grand, cascading, ongoing, interactive process. What smart people who write books call iterative, which I looked up. <laughs> I can use it in a sentence too, if you'd like. So creating, what is creativity? Owen Flanagan beautifully said that it's self-expression. It's performing oneself. So think about that. In the making to know paradigm, which is perfect process theology, right? there is no abstract knowing, there's only the knowing that emerges out of doing. And we are constantly both knowing and making ourselves. The Talmud teaches, I love this, that the interpretation of a dream is however it's interpreted. That means, by the way, be very careful, Freudians among you, because it actually means what you tell someone it means. Right? One of my worst days as a pulpit rabbi, what the period of my life my mother refers to as when I was a rabbi, <laughs> was I had a congregant come in and tell me that she had a dream that her deceased mother visited her and beckoned to her to come. And I was a smart enough son of a Freudian analyst to know I was not stepping into that. So I said what any good Freudian kid would say, I said, what do you think that means? And she said, well, it either means I'm about to die, or it means that my mother will be with me in whatever's coming. And I said, it means the second. <laughs> so performing oneself, because we don't know ourselves until we see how we act, what we do, what we say, and then we say, oh, I guess that's, that's who I am. And if we're attentive, then with time we see when we perform the best versions of ourself. When is it that we actually thrive? When is it that we're really there for the ones we care about? When is it we take stands that we look back on our life and we say, I don't know where I got the courage to do that, but I love that part of me that does that, and I want to do more of that. Right? That's the self-performance. Jerome Bruner talks about self-making stories. And again, we've heard already that you live your life as though it's art, but to think of our lives as a story unfolding. And we've heard from some of the writers up here, you have very little control over the characters in a fictional work. It turns out you also have very little control over the fictional character of yourself. Today, the part of Rabbi Artson will be played by a very handsome, tall man who could still lose a few. <laughs> Somehow in creativity, there's novelty. Maybe not objective novelty, but novelty for the person who's creating. Where we push ourselves to do or to see what we've never done or seen before. I mentioned that it's a process. There's a big debate among philosophers, does creativity have to have value, right? Could you be doing something really hideous and be creative about it? The people who brought you the death camps, does that count as creativity? Had never happened before, they thought of something utterly new, it was completely despicable and inhumane. Marquis de Sade, very creative, right? Um, Okay, I'm not going to touch more of that. <laughs> There's a way in which we are tempted to think that creativity happens to us, right? Even the guys in the shower 
who come up with great new insights. You know, I was just soaping myself up and boom, there it was. And so we tend to, again, fall back onto this childish notion of we are passive and things are given to us. But if you think about it, that person didn't start in the shower a blank slate. That person has been gnawing and chewing on this for a long time. Uh, if I can use the metaphor, a camel should not be surprised by the cud that it spits up and starts to chew. Right? It's been working at three stomachs already. Right? And we are too with our creativity. So a couple general thoughts and then I want to do some text with you that I think you'll enjoy. In process thought, one of the ways that process theology pisses off true believers is that Whitehead and others have said that God is not ultimate. What is ultimate in the universe, meaning nothing can exist without this, is creativity. It's an interesting thing. Once you see the universe as a series of becomings, then what you're struck by is that every becoming is creative. If you're alive, you're creating. If you exist, you are creating. Right? From the electrons that move onto a different energy circle when you inject some energy into it, to the fish that decided, hey, I'm sick of being wet all the time, I'm gonna crawl onto land and see how that works, to the first monkey who said, I'm getting out of this tree, my back is killing me, I'm gonna stand up. Right? Everybody is choosing. And that constant choosing is creativity, right? Doing what has never been done before. Welcome and congratulations. So, so if creativity is ultimate, then says Whitehead, says process thought, God is the greatest example of that creativity. Right? God's creativity is all the time, and all the time handed over to us. And I want to be clear here, us doesn't just mean people, us does not just mean mammals, us does not just mean organic matter. All becoming in the universe, stars and planets and dirt and water, everything is adding its contribution. The wonderful phrase that Whitehead used for that was he says, out of the many, one. So everything makes its choice, contributes that choice, and gets integrated into the universe that then exists at that moment. The many becoming one, and then increasing it by our own next choice. So I want to look at some examples of that kind of creativity. And these are two of my favorite rabbinic stories. So if you take a look first at the pretty colored picture, because I love you, and I want you to compare and contrast this with other people who teach you tonight, some of whom don't give you pretty multicolored graphics. <laughs> Just remember who loves you. In this graphic, the past is the red arrow on the left. And that's the past actual world. The world up until this instant. And that is a unity. Meaning you cannot change that past. Right? People, by the way, get confused about that because what we can do is change how we tell the story of the past. And that's sometimes just as important. When I was in high school, there was one woman in American history, she made a flag, and then there were no women until Eleanor Roosevelt, she went to the UN, and of course because I went to school in the early 70s, there hadn't been any significant women yet. So it just stopped, there were literally two women, no Native Americans, and there was a black guy who made peanut butter or something, but other than that, it turns out I studied the history of white men. There was one Jew. He gave money during the Revolutionary War. Right? But that was it. 
That was it. Other than that, there's only been Protestant men walking around this continent. It's a miracle that they had children. <laughs> but the past is unchanging, but what changes is what you think is significant in the past, what you think matters. So we've discovered all kinds of extraordinary people who didn't used to count. Right? And it's not that they weren't extraordinary, it's that people had lenses to filter that didn't let them see the magnificence around them. So that changes, but the past does not change. The future, on the other hand, is open and plural, meaning it's not been decided. Right? It has not been decided in physics, it's not been decided in biology, and here's the shocker, it's not even decided in real religion, although many Western theologians don't know that. But God throughout the Torah is surprised. God doesn't know the outcome. And God can't do it alone. God needs Noah, God needs Moses and Miriam and Aaron. Right? God cannot liberate those slaves without human leadership, human initiative, and human buy-in. The Israelites have to agree to walk out of Egypt. The mixed multitude have to agree to go with them. Right? So the future is open and plural. And what happens when the future comes at us, we, we, because we're trained in Western thinking, we think of history moving from the past into the future but that's not the motion. The motion is from the future into the present to the past. And it's a great big funnel. Every possible future comes to us and meets us at this moment. And at this moment, we have to decide what choice we're gonna make to embrace which possible future. And that choice is always freely yours, as it is freely anything in the cosmos. God cannot and will not dictate that choice. God has a preference. In process thought, we call the optimal choice, the choice that is optimal in terms of justice and love and experience and compassion, the lure, L-U-R-E. Right? So God lures us with a sense of the best possible choice at this moment. But here I want to jump in and say that choice is also pluralistic, meaning the lure for you at this moment is the sum total of everything in your life and past coming to you right now. And that's different than your lure because your lure has to be what's possible for you, given the sum total of your history, your experiences, everything you know, and what you're facing at this moment, which means we can never know what the lure is for someone else. If we're lucky, we can have clarity as to what it is for ourselves. And so our job isn't to tell someone else, you should be doing it my way. Our job is to get to know them well enough that we can ask good questions so they can figure out the lure for themselves. And that's where revelation kicks in. That star in the middle is the moment in which multiple futures distill into a single present which then immediately perishes and becomes the past. And history just keeps flowing in that direction. Choose the future, that choice becomes permanent. Once you've decided, you can make a different choice in the next moment of integration, but that choice is forever your journey, forever. And God will know it forever. Part of what I love about process thought is it also then says that God has real pathos. God has real feelings. If we make choices of violence or hard-heartedness or injustice or greediness, God will know that and feel pain forever. And if we rise up and in an expansive spirit, we 
find the ability to make connections, to help someone else, to do the right thing, that will give God eternal joy. Because God knows everything there is to know eternally. So two stories. Do I have five minutes left? Got ten. 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 Woo! <laughs> I am the richest man in L.A. All right, so the first story um, is a story about Moses. It's from the Talmud, from Menachot. I have put it to you in the original Aramaic, just so you know that I didn't make up this story. Someone else did. Um, it is found in the Talmud. It is a story that only the book like the Talmud can say. I just want to tell you one statistic about the Talmud that is my favorite Talmud statistic. My students have heard me say this before, but it, it bears repeating. The Talmud contains five, you'll be ahead, 5,000 arguments. Do you know how many of those arguments are resolved in the Talmud? 50. They're not idiots. 50. <laughs> But the Talmud knows that answers shut down conversations. Talmud's not interested in the answers. Answers are for rabbis. Right? What the Talmud wants is a really raucous conversation. And then it gets bored. So then they just move on to another argument. Right? And, and I love that about the Talmud. The Talmud is just constantly spitting out arguments and perspectives. And if you think that, then what do you do with that? And if you don't think that, then how, what do you do with that? And how do you make that fit together? And, and then now let's talk about something else. So here, and it also tells great stories. So here's a great story. Rav Yehuda says that Rav said, when Moses ascended on high, he found the Holy Blessing One sitting and tying crowns on the letters of the Torah. And Moses said before God, Master of the universe, who is preventing you from giving the Torah without these silly little ornaments? And God said, there's going to be a man who is destined to be born after several generations, and his name is Akiva ben Yosef. And he will derive from each and every one of these little marks thousands of halachot, thousands of Jewish principles, teachings. Okay, so now picture the scene. Moses is standing on the top of Mount Sinai, and there's God, the first scribe, hunched over a table, writing out in beautiful calligraphy, presumably, the Torah, the world's very first Torah. And instead of just writing the words, God is making these little sticks on top of some of the letters with little circles on top of the sticks. If you haven't seen an open Torah scroll, make one of the rabbis show you. Those letters have these little tagim, these little crowns on them that nobody knows what they're there for. The guy who wrote this story doesn't know what they're there for. That's why he's making up this story. Like, why in the world? Someone had to, and by the way, because we Jews, we never forget any random anything now when you write a Torah, you have to put the same little random marks. For all you know, some scribe was like writing, and then um, his partner came in and said, hey, I made you a matzah and haroset sandwich. You hungry? And he said, sure. And he got up and he pushed his pen and there was a mark. And now for hundreds of generations, we have to make that same mark on that same letter because of some haroset sandwich. <laughs> See, I just made up a Talmudic story. So, so Moses says, God, why are you doing that? And God says, you want to see? And he says, sure. So blink of an eye, and Moses finds himself in the presence of Rabbi Akiva, the greatest rabbi in the Talmud. And if you'd like to read a brilliant fictional account of his life, there's a book called The Orchard by Yochi Brandes. She's brilliant. Um, and it's a, it's a a fictional account, but she knows so much rabbinics, it's just unbearably delicious, this incredible book, told from the perspective of Akiva's wife. So, okay, so, so he says, show him to me, and so he says, okay, and so Moses is there, and the way rabbinic classrooms worked, 
the best student sat in the front row on the right, and then the second best student next to that one, and then the third and the fourth, and the fifth, and until you got to the back of the room. The back of the room were the novices, right? And then you just kind of hoped you would move up eventually, okay? So Moses is in the back of the room with the greenhorns, right? And, and he's watching this thing, and and when Akiva gets to a technical point of Torah law, one of his students says, Master, how do you know that? And he says, Halacha le Moshe Misinai. This was a law given to Moses at Mount Sinai. And Moses bursts into tears because he has no idea what Rabbi Akiva is talking about. Right? Like, first of all, he doesn't understand the rule. He doesn't understand the logic. And then Rebbe Akiva is saying he's the guy who's, whose idea it was. Right? And, and he doesn't know what to do with this. Um, and then God comforts him by saying, this is my desire. This is what I want. Um, I didn't continue the story. It has a tragic ending. Right? The tragic ending is he says, what's the reward? for someone who is so brilliant that he's able to derive rules that I could never, I, Moses, have imagined. And he shows him the Romans flaying his skin off with hot irons. Not a happy, they, they weren't great at like wrapping up stories. Don't make the movie with that ending. But what's incredible about this story is it suggests that the Torah we teach, Moses had no idea of and yet is somehow the author of it. So I want to ask you, what does that mean? What does that say about creativity? Because we Jews have been doing creative dancing with the Torah from the moment we got it. And the Torah that we read means things that our ancestors never intended, never saw. Right? We at Ikar are among the luckiest Jews in the world because each and every one of our rabbis gets up and does dazzling dances with Torah. And the authenticity of their teaching is found by the way they derive things from Torah that in a million years we would never have seen. But neither would Moses. Neither would Rabbi Akiva. So in what way is it the Torah of Moses? That's a question. How does that Torah creativity work? I'm not going to get you, you can wait for, I'm not about to answer that question. What do you think? This is a story about creativity. I want to ask you a question that would be bugging me. Quick thing, they say, Yes. Yes. But the free choice is given. Yes. I could never reconcile it. So give me your verse. Oh, okay. Is it on? No, she wants you to speak without having it on. <laughs> I have no problem. I can raise my voice. I have no. So the question is um, in Pirkei Avot, it is actually Rebbe Akiva who says that all is in the hands of heaven except for the choices people make. Um, this is impossible. Rebbe Akiva was many things. He was not a philosopher. If God, with a certainty, knows what choice you're going to make, then you don't have free will. So he's wrong. But what Rebbe Akiva, to his credit, is saying is, I think I have to believe in an all-powerful God who's in control, even though you look out at the world and it's clear that that can't be the case. Um, yet I'm unwilling to give up on human freedom and responsibility. So I know this is a paradox, but I'm going to hold on to it anyway. All right, but back to our normal story. Um, look at the way that creativity builds on what it has inherited, but is not bound to replicate it. All right? The Torah that each generation is called to produce is unprecedented, is unpredictable. Each generation, in some important way, betrays the preceding generations. And that's Torah. 
Like that's the process of Torah. If you don't see things in Torah that are different than the generation before you, then why bother with your generation? If each of us are to make the Torah uniquely great, then we have to bring novelty in what we read. This is an age in which God is asking us to find trans people in the Torah. This is an age in which God is asking us to transcend racial bias or gender prejudice or supremacy or imperialism, all kinds of things that we're commanded to see. And the fact that the generation before us didn't see it is because each generation stands on the shoulders of the one before. That's true for great creative artists too. The most improvisational of the artists have been practicing their scales for 10,000 hours. They know what they're riffing on. That's why they're so good at it. Right? It takes enormous effort to be spontaneous and unrehearsed. Right? That's what Rebbe Akiva is doing here. And that's what gives Moses comfort. Moses says, even though in a million years I would never have thought that the Torah means what Rebbe Akiva says, I can see that the process that I launched, he's doing. And that's comforting. I know I'm an old rabbi, and one of the ways I know is I go speak at the communities of my former students. And they do something utterly brilliant in the middle of whatever they're doing. And someone says to them, where did you think of that? And they point to me and they say, he taught me that. No, I would never have thought of that. But what they mean by that is that I gave them the tools and the permission to do something that no one had thought of before. And that's Torah. So I am going to respect the time. I'm going to close. You can do the second story on your own, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I want to say one last thing, and then you can say something too. Um, creativity, we've heard from several of the panelists, involves the coming together of another paradox. Broad, open possibility that somehow have to get fed into narrow, unforgiving constraints. I have an hour to write every morning. Or I'm going to choose to use charcoal, which can't do what pastels can do, or watercolor. Or I'm going to use watercolor, and then watercolor is going to coerce me to make certain choices that I wouldn't have to make if I was using acrylics. Right? But the combination of constraint and freedom, that's what bakes creativity into reality, right? We need both. And in a sense, what Torah does is gives us both. We have the constraint of the text in front of us, and then we read it through our own eyes, through the needs of our own time. And therefore, we see things in it that no one saw before. And that's revelation. It is said of Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrkanos that when he got up to teach, when he had just finished rabbinical school, newly ordained rabbi, and he taught Torah, and the, the Midrash says he taught Torah that had never before been heard in the world. 2,000-year-old creativity, right? Don't give me the same tired old Torah that I've heard a million times before. That's not revelation. And it was said that at that moment, his sun shone like the sun in the middle of the day. And people were checking their ears to see if they had actually heard what he had really said, because no ear had ever heard it before. And the rabbis of old are praising that as that's what Sinai looks like. It's new. It's fresh. No one's heard it before and it was there waiting to be discovered. Shalom. All right, thank you so much, Rabbi Artsin. That reminds me of a sermon I heard from a bar mitzvah boy uh, just a few days ago. Um, Sammy uh, gave an incredible talk, and, and what, what, I, what I'm so moved by here, if I can just reflect for a moment, is that 
how much faith you have to have in the halakha or in the Torah itself that it won't break when the next generation trained in the ways of the previous generation finds a different narrative or different story. You have to really have that faith. Um, so that was so powerful. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and then let me just tell you what's going to happen. Back in this room... Uh